So welcome and good morning, everyone. We've been getting uh, a lot of questions about uh, wills, powers of attorney and trusts, particularly uh, recently due to the current circumstances. So we're really excited to share with you some thoughts, tips and advice on this. We're going to base this series of three webinars on an example family, so hopefully it'll bring it to life a little bit more. And we're going to be running through that shortly. In this webinar, which is the first of three that we'll be doing, we're going to be focusing on Thomas and Sarah. <clears throat> so let me introduce you to the other presenters and then we can jump straight into the webinar itself. So I'm Duncan Bailey and I head up the private client uh, department here at Bradner's. Now we've been conscious that the term private client isn't necessarily self-explanatory to everyone. So we've recently launched something called Bradner's Personal. And um, Bradner's Personal is, uh, to put it simply, a coming together of all of the services we offer as a firm to individuals rather than businesses. And so effectively the services that we can offer you. So I'm joined by my colleague, Helen Marriott, who's also at Bradner's. Hi, Helen, are you there? Good morning, Duncan, how are you? Yeah, all good, all good. Now, Helen heads the family department at Bradner's, which is also an intrinsic part of Bradner's personal. And then finally, we've got Moira O'Shaughnessy of FPC, who should be here. Hi, Moira. How's your day going? Good morning, everyone. Hi, Duncan. Nice to be here. So uh, we've got Moira here so that we don't uh, get too focused on just the legal issues and Moira can actually help demonstrate on how good financial planning is an intrinsic part of successful overall estate planning. Now we're going to take questions and answer these at the end, ask as many as you like and we'll get through as many as we can but uh, uh, don't worry if we don't get through all of them because what we're planning on doing is actually doing some form of follow-up if that's okay. Now, there should be a, a box on your screens where you can ask questions, so type them in there and then we'll get round to those at the end. So, without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Moira initially, who's going to talk us through the, the family case study, if that's okay. So, over to you, Moira. Thanks, Duncan. So, good morning, everyone. I'm Moira O'Shaughnessy, um, Managing Partner of the Financial Planning Corporation, based in Ainsdale, near Southport. And I'm delighted to be co-hosting the uh, series of webinars with Helen and Duncan and to be supporting the Bradness Personal Initiative. As chartered financial planners, it's our job to help our clients secure their future, protect those who rely on them and live life well with peace of mind. And we do that by providing the financial planning and independent investment advice they need to achieve their goals. But as you'll see today, it's a team effort and we've all got a role to play in helping you plan for that road ahead. As Duncan said, over this series of webinars, we're going to be looking at a client family over a number of generations and thinking about the issues they face. And what I'm going to show you now is our family tree, and I can introduce those characters to you. At the top of the tree, we've got Thomas and Sarah. They've been retired for some years after Thomas has enjoyed a long and successful medical career. They've got two children, John and Claire. John sadly has just recently gone through a divorce, hence that little dotted line you can see, and they're hoping to help him get back on his feet. He's got two children, Patrick and Millie, who are still at school, and in fact Thomas and Sarah have been helping with their education costs for some years, and they're committed to doing that right through to 18, as they did for their other grandchildren. Then we've got Claire. Claire's married to Peter, they're 30 years married next year, and Peter's 16, and they've got a big milestone coming up, with that, but also they're facing the potential sale of their business, having an offer on the table. So they've got lots to think about there, the implications for them and also for their children. Sophie, who's married to Steve, and they've got a little girl, Alice, and another on the way. And then we've got Fred, who's living with his girlfriends in a flat in London, contemplating perhaps the next move and getting onto the housing ladder. In our next session, we're going to focus on Claire and Peter and the implications of the sale of a business and all that means for the family. But this week, we're going to start at the top of the tree with Thomas and Sarah. In their 80s now, Thomas and Sarah have had a long and active, healthy life, but they're slightly concerned now that Sarah's having some memory problems, and that's a bit of a, a worry. 
they're also worried about John and they want to help him get back on his feet. But whatever they do for one, they do for another. They've always treated John and Claire the same. And so the concern to keep that fairness. And at the back of their mind, of course, is their own concern for their own long-term care. But the big decision they've got facing them is whether or not to downsize. There's a chance to do that now, to move close to their daughter, especially with a new grandchild coming on the way. So we're going to look at this in a bit more detail and think about the decisions they face. To do that, we use something called an AIMS model. AIMS, which is quite handy for the road ahead theme, is asset and income modeling. And we use these tools to build a lifetime cash flow model for a client so they can play what if and look at different scenarios. Now, like any model, it's only as good as its assumptions and it's a decision making tool. So we've got to review those assumptions carefully, and make sure we factor in inflation, interest rates, investment returns and tax. And of course, all those things can change. So it's important to keep these things under regular review. So let's have a little look at Thomas and Sarah's AIMS model. We're going to begin by seeing what's coming in and what's going out. Now, don't worry too much if you can't see the numbers on the screen. It's the shape that really counts. The colours you can see, firstly, are in the burgundy colour. That's their state pensions coming in over their lifetime, increasing each year in line with inflation. And then there's a big chunk of orange. Now, this is where Thomas benefits from a very um, uh, solid pension income that comes from his NHS years. On top of that, They've got some annuity income, which comes from his earnings from private practice. Like many of their generation, they're fortunate to benefit from guaranteed pensions, something which is more of a challenge for the next generation, which we'll cover in a future session. Most significant here is the black line that you can see. In those early years, you can see it's a bit higher, and that's because of the extra school fees commitment they've got going on. But then it drops down. And what we can see is they've got a surplus of income. And that's been really handy, actually, because that's enabled them to gift those sums out of their estate on a regular basis. And as a result, they fall off their estate immediately for inheritance tax because they're out of their surplus income. It's an underutilized allowance. But they've made good use of it. And in fact, this chart suggests that perhaps they could continue to do that because they're still adding to their savings and their income exceeds their needs. Now, if we look behind a little bit, we have a look at their balance sheet. This family balance sheet shows it's a little, quite a simple estate now. They've always lived within their means, and that's enabled them over the years to help Claire and, and John with education costs, university, and with substantial deposits towards house purchase, purchases many years ago now. So here, if we look at their estate, they've got a decent cash reserve, something we always recommend, at the moment held in Sarah's name, but we might review that in view of their health concerns. And then they've got a chunk of money, mostly now in ISIS. There's a small little portfolio there that's being decanted across each year. Now they like those ISIS. They know that they can grow tax free, which is really useful because Thomas and Sarah are high rate taxpayers. And then we've got um, the fact that they can take a tax free income from those ISIS if they ever need to. And finally, they're aware that if either of them died, the ISIS can pass from one to the other and stay within that valuable tax wrapper. So they don't really want to touch them. They view them as their backstop. So their main asset is their family home, a substantial asset, 1.125 million pounds. It's a lovely house in a sought after area with a bit of land with it. So now we want to play what if. What if they downsize? What about the long-term care concern? Can they afford to gift? They'd like to help John, can they do it? So in this next example, you'll see another AIMS chart where we've actually looked at them downsizing and releasing £500,000. In blue, you can see their property and how that drops as that, as that cash is released. It doesn't go into cash, though. It's all going to be given away. So you can see their cash in the grey doesn't particularly increase. Their ices, though, are still untouched because, of course, they've still got more income than they need. So their estate continues to grow over time. Again, supporting the theory that perhaps they can continue that surplus gifting from income. Now, what we've got to bear in mind is two things. Firstly, their inheritance tax and that long-term care concern. The black line you can see at the bottom is their current inheritance tax liability. It starts at £430,000, which is 23% of their estate. Now, they're quite fortunate. They benefit from this main residence 
nil rate band, which is an extra inheritance tax allowance on top of the usual £325,000 they've got each. What you can see in that black line is that the big gift, the 500,000 will fall off the page in seven years time and we can see the inheritance tax figure reducing. Now, I don't need to show you lots of graphs, but I can tell you that if we model out further, we can look at continuing that extended gifting and factoring in long-term care as well. And they're still okay. In fact, we worked out that they would have to gift twice as much a year for them to actually break that model. So where we ended up in summary, Thomas and Sarah can downsize and gift with confidence. And they'll, they're fiercely independent. They don't want to be a burden on anyone. And so they know that they're going to be secure long term. But it's more also about peace of mind. They want to know that any gifts that they do give are protected. And importantly, when they do go, they want to be sure that everything's tidy, their affairs are in order and they've been fair. Now, all of that's achievable with planning too. And here's Duncan to tell you how. Thank you. Thanks, Moira. So we've got Thomas and Sarah wanting to give away half a million pounds to John and Claire when they downsize, which sounds very nice, but will it be? And what I mean by that is <clears throat> it might not be quite so nice for John if his inheritance were lost in his divorce and may not be quite so nice for Claire if her family lose 40% of that in inheritance tax. So what are the key issues we're actually looking at? Well, we've got Thomas and Sarah wanting to give away cash. They want both the children to benefit from all of that. And they want Claire and John to ultimately have benefited from the same amount so that there's equality between them. So let's focus on these three points. Giving away assets, especially cash, is generally pretty straightforward. There are some taxes to take into account, but cash is by far and away the easiest asset to give away compared with, say, a house or investments. Giving away assets during your lifetime is also a great strategy for paying less inheritance tax. <clears throat> so what are the issues? Well, we've got John getting divorced. If Thomas and Sarah had given him £250,000, uh, being half of the amount that they were hoping to give away post the downsize, uh, if they'd given it to him at the time that he was getting divorced, this may have been lost, uh, uh, which I'm pretty certain is not what John, Thomas or Sarah would have wanted. So are there any solutions to this? We often suggest to clients that they consider the use of a trust to hold assets where they want to give away assets, but there's an issue of the recipient receiving directly. Now, frequently this will be because the, uh, the recipient needs to be protected, possibly because they're too young or not sufficiently settled, or it could just be that the recipient is in a bad relationship or in our scenario, John, in the case of getting divorced. So what's the trust I hear you asking? Well, a trust is essentially a holding device where you have custodians of the, in our case, cash called trustees, holding the assets within the trust for the beneficiaries, which in our example is John. Now, the terms on which they hold the assets is something that you'll decide on when you create the trust. I will talk more about trusts in uh, the other webinars that we've got coming up, so you'll get a better feel for how they work in practice. So a trust might be a suitable vehicle for John's money, uh, but Helen would most certainly kill me if I suggested that a trust is safe from an attack uh, in a divorce. It isn't, but it's a heck of a lot better than a better lot, heck of a, a lot better protected than if John had the money in his own bank account. Clients are understandably really concerned about relationship breakdowns of their children. But we've got Claire here and she's blissfully married about to celebrate 30 years. So why on earth would uh, Thomas and Sarah consider a trust for her? Well, Claire and her husband, as Moira explained, uh, Claire and Peter have been very successful and are financially well off. They're looking at their own inheritance tax issues. And if the quarter of a million pounds were given directly to Claire from Thomas and Sarah, this would just result in making this inheritance tax problem even worse 
which could result in them losing 40% of the inheritance in tax. Now, Thomas and Sarah could simply bypass Claire and leave her inheritance to her children, but it might be that Claire felt she might like to be able to benefit from some of that money at some stage. And if that was the case, then a trust may well be the answer again. The trust could hold the money for, for Claire, but it sits outside of her estate for inheritance tax, which could save £100,000, being 40% of the quarter of a million. Now, I mentioned that Thomas and Sarah wanted to give away the half million pounds, but in our scenario, this may be more in favour of John than Claire, given his current circumstances. I also mentioned that, like most parents, they're keen to ensure that both that the children have been uh, uh, equally uh, recipients of, the, of their estate overall. It's not uncommon uh, for parents to have made unequal gifts to the children uh, during their lifetimes, but then ultimately want to equalise this. Wills can be used to do this, and uh, is just one of a myriad of different reasons why it's so important to have a will and indeed an up-to-date will. So please do get in touch if you haven't got a will or your will needs dusting off and reviewing. Now, something called a hotchpot clause can be included in a will, uh, which means the executors can take account of the lifetime gifts that have been made and then make an equalisation payment when they're distributing the estate. However, this clause can uh, sometimes be a bit of a blunt provision. And yet again, a trust can help here. It provides the trustees with the flexibility to take account of what each child has had, but not all gifts or, or all benefits need to be taken account of, and so it's that much more flexible than the hotchpot clause. Now, just picking up on something that Moira mentioned about the residence nil rebound, that inheritance tax relief, a trust can impact on the availability of this relief, so it's really important to get some proper planning and some careful drafting within the wills so that a trusts can be used to be to, uh, to benefit from, but that, that uh, relief isn't lost. So in summary, planning with wills and trusts could a help John avoid losing his inheritance in a divorce, could b help save Claire's family that £100,000 in inheritance tax, and c can provide Thomas and Sarah with peace of mind that they have actually been able to provide an equal benefit to both of the children. Now, before I finish and hand over to Helen, I just wanted to touch on powers of attorney. Moira mentioned that Sarah is losing her memory, and so it's imperative that she has powers of attorney in place. Many of you will uh, uh, previously have done enduring powers of attorney. Now, these are still valid, but they really ought to be reviewed to ensure that they still achieve what you want now that, been, now that they've been replaced by something called lasting powers of attorney or LPAs. These are much wider than enduring powers of attorney as uh, not only do they cover financial matters, but it also enables you to provide your attorneys to make health and welfare issues, meaning you're much better protected. However, it's not just when people are getting on that they should consider powers of attorney, of course. A loss of physical or mental capacity can be caused by a myriad of things, and it's not just old age. Uh, an accident, a fall, stroke, or rather topical in the current climate, a virus can, of course, all cause issues with capacity. So everyone should have a power of attorney uh, in place, just as they should a will. Now, I may have time in one of the future webinars to go into a bit more detail about powers of attorney. But if Helen is ready, I'm going to pass yeah. over to her now and she can uh, talk about how uh, asset protection, about uh, asset protection considerations from a family law perspective. Thank you very much, Duncan. Um, the first thing to say is that family law is a vast area. And it's important to know that the court has got a very wide discretion in terms of how to divide assets on divorce or relationship breakdown. 
And it's sensible, therefore, to take specialist advice to ensure that what you're doing regarding gifting or tax and estate planning doesn't potentially create other problems from a family law perspective. <clears throat> I'm just going to touch today on two issues concerning Thomas and Sarah's plans. And the first is the monies that they advanced years ago to John and Jenny to buy their home. Well, how would the family court look at that in the context of John and Jenny's divorce? And secondly, if they do advance further monies to John post-divorce, can his ex-wife Jenny have a claim on those? And secondly, what about claims from any new partner? So let's wind the clock back and look at the monies that Thomas and Sarah advanced to John and Jenny many years ago to help them buy their home, a very usual situation. Well, in this scenario, Thomas and Sarah gifted the monies to, Tom's, uh, to John and Jenny, and they simply wanted to help them get on the property ladder and they were not expecting to get the monies back. However, I often see a situation whereby grandparents or, or parents, whoever has done the gifting, are very upset at the time of any later divorce that their generosity is not necessarily going to be treated as a positive on John's side of the balance sheet. Now, the family court will always look at meeting needs first, but they'll look at the reality. Now, the matrimonial home in this divorce is held in John and Jenny's joint names. There's no mention of Thomas and Sarah anywhere near the title. And that distant gift has been treated by John and Jenny throughout the marriage as a gift to both of them. So the family court is not going to attach much, if any weight, to that original gift. Clearly, gifting money to children and grandchildren is a very sensible idea, not only from a tax perspective, but also on a personal basis. You naturally want to help your children. So what could Thomas and Sarah have done to maximise its protection? Well, the first thing to bear in mind is that the family court usually starts its analysis by saying that the matrimonial home should be shared equally, whoever has contributed to it, and however it is owned. But the court can move away from that 50-50 idea, but it is the usual starting point. Well, here, Thomas and Sarah could have made it clear that the monies that they advanced to help buy the home were a loan rather than a gift by having a proper loan agreement drawn up and setting out when it was to be repaid. Um, alternatively, they could have had a charge rather like a mortgage um, on the home. But the issue with those scenarios, of course, is that those monies are then not out of Thomas and Sarah's estate for IHT purposes. But at least they would have made it very clear that those monies were not an outright gift. So it's a balance. But as I said earlier, gifting monies down the generations is a good thing. So is there anything that they could have done which did not conflict with their IHT planning? but also made it more likely to be ring-fenced in John's hands in the divorce. Well, what they could have done is to suggest that John invested that, that gift in an asset or investment in his sole name, which then throughout the marriage, he did not mingle with any jointly built up funds, i.e. it was always going to be treated as his asset. He could then argue within the family court that that was non-matrimonial in nature, i.e. it was built up from a source wholly external to the marriage with no contribution from Jenny. Now, whilst that's not a guaranteed outcome, it's a very good argument to run and it could very well find favour with the judge. I'm going to talk about the interaction of trusts and family law in later webinars, as that's another way of trying to protect family money going down the generations. So the other issue I want to focus on very briefly is on life post-divorce for John and the fact that Thomas and Sarah want to help him just as well as they want to help their daughter Claire by gifting monies to help him get re-established. So the first question to ask is what kind of divorce settlement did John get? Has he got what's called a clean break from Jenny or is he still paying her some ongoing spousal maintenance, which means there's still a continuing financial link between them? Well, if so, then it's possible for certain parts of an order to be varied at a later stage. Here in this scenario, there is a clean break, so there's no need to worry. But what about if John meets a new partner? 
Well, the key theme to be aware of there is that there is a massive difference between claims which a spouse can make on relationship breakdown, which are vast, um, as opposed to very limited claims which a former cohabitee can bring. And in basic terms, a cohabiting partner can only bring claims which are referable to a property in which the parties have lived. So here, if John does buy a property with some financial help from his parents, then he'd be well advised to buy that property in his sole name and to have a cohabitation agreement, making it clear <clears throat> that any new cohabiting partner does not have and never will have an interest in his property. If John were to think about remarriage, then he should certainly take advice about having a prenuptial agreement in place so as to ring fence certain assets. So in a nutshell, Thomas and Sarah can therefore downsize and gift with confidence to both their children and the wider families. But the key is for them to be mindful of how that gifting is then fully protected in the hands of the younger generation. I'm now going to hand back to Moira. Thanks, Helen. So what have we given you to take away from today? Well, firstly, hopefully you can see that we all understand that financial planning is not just about numbers. It's about people and families and helping them address their worries and their concerns. And hopefully you've seen that by working collaboratively and by actually looking at things very much from a personal perspective, we can help you plan for that road ahead. I'd like to stress the importance of the three steps of the financial planning process. It's actually a process and an approach that we all follow in our work. FPC clients will be familiar with this. Understand, plan, review, then repeat. All too often the urge is to jump into the planning stage and do something. So someone might sell a business and feel that they've got to take action to get the money invested. Actually, far better to pause and take time to really understand their position. And review, I can't stress the importance of that enough. That so much is changing. Just where we are now, who would have thought we'd be dealing with the, the situation we're all in? But actually, life does change. Relationships, health, wealth. And so it's important to review. And there are so many factors outside of our control. Well, stock markets, the political landscape, the economy, tax and legislation, all those things change. And so regular reviews are essential. We would urge that now at the time, perhaps, to take some time out and reflect on that and review your own planning. We've all done the decluttering, the garage is tidy. So my final message would be to actually pop your financial planning on your to-do list for the next few months. We're here to help and we're happy to answer any queries that you may have. And I'm gonna hand back now to Duncan and we'll hopefully take some questions. Thanks folks. Thank you very much, Moira. It appears that I've become the thorn between two roses here. Oh. Um, now we'll uh, we'll have a look at some some questions now. I can see that some questions have been coming through. So whilst Moira and Helen are catching their breath, why don't I take uh, one of the first ones? Okay. So uh, we've got a question here. Um, can uh, I have more than one attorney? This relates to uh, the power of the attorney I was talking about earlier. So the answer is yes, you can have uh, multiple attorneys, and if you've got more than one, uh, you can either have them acting concurrently, or you can actually have attorneys that come into play one after the other. So if the prior appointment can't act, for example. So to put that into our example, uh, let's say Sarah. Sarah might like to have Thomas as her attorney, but if he were unable to act, whether he had lost his capacity or got a bit of, uh, passed away, then she might have her children, John and Claire, as her attorneys. Helen, Moira, are you? Yeah, okay I've got one. Grab one. Yep. Um, how does your AIMS model cope with changing assumptions, especially at a time like this? Great question. Um, I developed the first AIMS model for FPC 20 odd years ago. Spreadsheets coming out of my ears, and thankfully, We've moved on nowadays, we have very powerful software that helps us do this modeling, but it's not a black box approach, it's got to be bespoke. And our team regularly review the sort of assumptions that we put in. Um, and we can stress test too. So we could say, you know, what if inflation is twice what we expect? Or what if we have a sudden stock market uh, fall as we have had recently? And perhaps it doesn't recover. Um, what's the impact of that? 
Um, so it, it is important to keep them regularly under review. But the, probably the most uh, challenging assumption to get right is what you take out, what you spend, um, because that really drives the model. And so we do spend time helping you figure that out. Um, we've got some handy apps and, and, and tools you can do that with. But I think for business owners in particular, um, often it's not laughed as you realise just how many people the business is supporting, family as well as yourself. And so really important to do those numbers before a sale and not afterwards. Um, but we'll get into that next week. Okay. Helen? Um, I've got one here. Um, it's an old chestnut of a question, to be honest, which is, um, are prenups, are prenuptial agreements, are they binding? Um, well, the simple answer is no, they're not automatically binding, um, but they can carry um, significant weight. Um, as at the time of a divorce, if challenged, then the very existence of a prenup can limit or reduce the amount that the other party could get, you know, if there was no prenup at all. Um, and that goes back to the discretionary nature and powers of the family court. So, you know, the advice has to be always take advice um, to give peace of mind. Um, especially, I would say, if you're trying to ring fence assets or it's a, a second marriage, for example. Um, Duncan, do you have another question? Yeah, let me just... Uh... Okay, so one here. Can uh, John and Claire be trustees of their trust? So, um, uh, yeah, that's quite an easy to want to answer. The simple answer is yes, they can. Uh, there's no problem about you being a trustee and a beneficiary uh, or vice versa. Uh, there can be some practical reasons why you might not want a beneficiary to be trustee, but we would advise on that more on a specific case by case basis. Okay, I've got another one. Um, yeah, how much can you give away each year free of inheritance tax? Um, well, first point is you can give away anything you like as long as you survive seven years, it falls off the page currently. Uh, and that's under current legislation. We're going to be talking about changes in legislation in the future session. Um, but you've also got an annual allowance of £3,000 per individual. And if you haven't used it the year before, you can bring that forward. And there's some small gift allowances as well. But I suspect the question refers to me talking about gifting surplus income. Um, if you have surplus income and you can give that away and there's no restriction on the amount, as long as you're not eating into your own capital. Um, now, the, the couple of caveats, you've got to be able to prove it. So proving income is pretty easy, tax returns, etc. But again, it's back to tracking expenditure um, that you need to do to be able to, to have the, the information to back this up. Um, but it's a really good relief, actually, and, and one that um, uh, people should utilise if they can. OK, Helen, back to, back to you. Uh, yeah, I've got one here, which um, I think actually is applicable to all of us. But it's, uh, it's this. When should you take advice? Um, well, hopefully what we've demonstrated this morning is that it's best to have a joined up approach. Um, what I'm talking about in simple terms is putting protective measures in place. Uh, to give peace of mind from a family law perspective, um, which is just the same theory as Moira's Ames modelling um, and Duncan's estate planning. So I think the simple message, if I may, um, to take away today is to say, look at all the pieces of the jigsaw at the same time um, to hopefully create the picture um, that you want to see. Um, we can see that we've got an awful lot more questions um, lined up. So apologies. I think we're probably going to start wrapping up um, at this point, but we will come back um, with full answers um, on all of those other questions. Thank you very much for those. Um, I want to say thank you very much indeed for joining us today. Um, we hope that you found this session thought provoking and useful. Uh, do please join us in two weeks' time as we meet daughter Claire and we look at the issues which are facing her and her husband as they contemplate selling their business. Um, and we do hope you will join us. Um, the invitation will be uh, following shortly. But um, for now, many thanks indeed for your time today, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye now.